feeling just a smile they would feel the father's love even in just a smile they would feel the father's love good morning al shaddai good morning a warm welcome to each and every one of you. Won't you just stand and say hello to someone you haven't seen in a while? here this morning and just watching you greet everyone it just makes me feel like I want to come down there and also do some hugs and high fives and everything also a warm welcome to our online viewers this morning why we are so excited for you to be joining us thank you for tuning in yes so we serve a gentle kind compassionate father in heaven so let's see it says here, yeah, in Colossians, it says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, we are dearly loved. Clothe yourselves this morning in worship. Let's clothe ourselves this morning with compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And as we just worship this morning and we allow the Holy Spirit to just clothe us with the gentleness and the kindness and God's compassion, may the Father just touch you this morning because we all know He's a good, good Father. So Lord, we come this morning and as we quiet our hearts and we quiet our minds, we open our arms. We open our arms wide to you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, won't you just move this morning as we draw close to you? Your 
perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You are perfect. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect.
space here. I want us just to camp on this song for a while. I feel that God is just doing something to stir afresh the hunger for the Holy Spirit. There's nothing more important than hungering for God and hungering for the Holy Spirit. And if he's touching this song uh, this morning, we want to stay here a while. And just before we stay here a while, I'm just going to uh, just tune in for, to this little word here and then we'll, we'll ask God to do this. And I just had a picture from the Lord of a huge cravat and He's pouring out His oil, His Holy Spirit over us, but it's our decision whether we want to press in or how deeply we allow Him to touch us. Good morning, church. Um, last, the previous night, I had a dream of this big mansion. It was almost like um, like a cell group that I went to, but I didn't know the people in the cell group. But it was a huge mansion, and um, I would I, it gave me the sense that people were quite wealthy at this uh, particular place. And um, as I was walking down, uh, it was like on the top levels, like a double story house, right? And as I was uh, walking to the more to the uh, downside of the house there was a huge window which I looked out at and it was like a, a big lawn and after the lawn there was like a swimming pool and then it went into the beach area and um, I saw people in the swimming pool but the swimming pool was almost covered like a little wall but only the host knew about who was in the swimming pool so it was almost like what I found business interest people that he was associated with but as, as if the church would not know about that and um, as I if, if after that I basically left the house as we were exiting and I didn't see anybody in the swimming pool anymore but I had the sense I thought about should I give this word or not but I thought afterwards I felt very sad after that because I felt like the heart of God like in Acts was for people when they were together in unity. They sold their possessions. They gave up their lives for each other. And I'm not saying be broke and, you know, like um, give everything in an in a irresponsible way. However, I do feel the, the heart of God is for us to, to give to each other. The, the people that I did see in that swimming pool, I saw this one particular person as well. And I, I really felt there's a lot of people that God has, or there are people perhaps that God has promoted you. God has given you authority over people now. You've been financially advantaged because of that. And I just want to just tell you that that is because of the grace of God that you are in that position. It's not because of your own efforts. And because of that, God wants to use it for the glory of Him. And um, 
yeah, I don't know if I'm making sense this morning, but just to use that for the kingdom of God. And yeah, um, yeah, just for God to be glorified as well. And not to keep business and financial interests away from the kingdom of God. It's got a bit of a challenge this morning, but it's just for us to open our hearts up and to hear what God is saying about that area in our lives. Thank you. Okay, these two words are very closely linked, okay? So the first one, in case you didn't hear, was just of a cravat of oil being poured out. And it's been poured out right now, but it's there for those that want to receive it. So that's a big deal, and that's why we need to just stay with the song for a while and just receive from that. If, that, if, that, uh, if you respond to that, if you can hear the heart of God in that, an anointing oil being poured out, and you can receive that, then the Holy Spirit can just stir something afresh inside you. That's what He wants to do. But here's the deal when we're anointed. It's so that we can serve the kingdom and the world. It's so that we can give our business interests, our, our, our life interests to the kingdom. It's never just for ourselves. We're there to receive this morning. It's like you come into a service here. You lay your swords and your tools and all your business stuff at the door. You come into the safe place and you fill up with the anointing oil of God to the point that you are overflowing. But the purpose is to overflow. The purpose is to overflow into another person's life. The purpose is to overflow into the kingdom realities and the business interests and, and the financial interests. And so these two words are deeply linked here. As we come and we just camp on this song for a while and we allow that anointing to touch us, to fill us. And at the same time, we have to pray, God, let this overflow. God, let this overflow. Because here's how the kingdom works. The more you give and the more you give away, the more he fills you. It's never just to be about us. It's about to be the kingdom and the world around us. So God is doing something special here. We're going to stay with the song just for a while longer. And we're just going to let God do that. But hey, it's in our hearts now to receive it and to receive it to its full so that God can do what he wants to do. You with us? Hey, does it feel right to you? Then let's just engage something special from God right now.
Cause you're wonderful and such a good father. Let's sing it again. Set all my life, tell us who you are. And the wonder of your never ending love. Yes, so let all my life, tell us who you are. That you're wonderful and such a good father. Father's love, help me, help me to love with open arms like you do. A love that erases all the lines and sees the truth. Oh, that when they look in my eyes, they would see you, even in just a smile. They would feel the Father's love. I don't know if you can spot something that has happened this morning, but those prophetic words led us from the Spirit into a challenge to let it overflow into the world. And the song choice this morning did exactly the same. This last song is a challenge from the homeless to the famous to let the love of God spread. It's the exact same pattern touched by a prophetic word and confirmed in worship because worship and, and, and prophecy often link together. It would really be foolish not to spot that this morning and just to bow our heads and just let a prayer come from deep within us. If you can see a very uh, unique thing of God because, you know, you can't make this stuff up. Yeah then you can see a call of God in worship. And so, Holy Spirit, I first want to pray for each of us here, Lord, for that touch and that renewed uh, thirst and hunger for your Holy Spirit in a fresh way, because you are doing that in this season. And so, God, just make us thirsty, thirsty, thirsty again. But, Lord, make it never, ever go back to being about us, because that seems to be your message for this season. That the outflow of the Holy Spirit is now for the homeless to the famous. And so just as you start to shift the spirit realm and you start to do something fresh inside us, just deeply embedded in the prophecies and the worship this morning, we hear a clarion call, a trumpet call, that you are desirous to pour out your spirit afresh, a, a, a carafe of oil. That's a lot. And yet, Lord, you're just saying so directly, this cannot be about just us again. It cannot be about that. It's for the homeless to the famous, for the glory of God. And let's praise him, folks. Let's give him praise. Ah. Generous praise this morning. You can't make this stuff up, eh? And then before you sit down, just to say how's it to at least five people around you again. If you see, you know, we never came here to worship God alone. We came here to worship God in community. So, thank you.
Right, good morning. Those of you watching online now or later, hello, welcome. I just pray that this, this, just this richness and the sensitivity of the Spirit here today is for you across all these kind of fibers and things like that as well. It's very, very real. If you are a visitor here, a special welcome to you. If you didn't get a little leaflet as you came in, uh, please get one at the info desk. And please join us for coffee afterwards. In the leaflet, there's a little voucher inviting you to uh, join us for coffee. We hope you won't rush off. We hope you will stay. You will have coffee. If you want to chat to somebody, just tell them at the info desk, and they'll just connect you, uh, and uh, you can enjoy some coffee as well. If you are not in the habit of using EFT for your tithes and your offerings afterwards, there will be a box on my left, on your right, and if you prefer that way of doing it, you can make use of that after the service as well. Just before I share with you some of the notices, just a little bit of family news. We just want to tell you that Zendre's dad, Quibus Nell, passed away yesterday. If you know Zendre or Essie or Irvold or any of the family, uh, you may want to just reach out to them and uh, just share the peace of God with them. Especially to Zendre, it's also her birthday today. So uh, if, you, if you've got a number there, just send her a quick message as well. And I also just want to say happy birthday to Christian at the back. He looks after all our live streams, so he really deserves a happy birthday as well. <laughs> a couple of big notices coming up, so just tune in, please, so that you can catch what's happening in, uh, uh, in the place. Firstly, uh, Turby uh, from Cross Point Family Consultants is running his Financial Foundations course uh, from the 1st of September, uh, it's four in-person evening sessions. I commend this to you, and I, uh, if you haven't done it, I hope that you will jump onto the website, our website, there's the address at the bottom, and that you will just get all the details there and make use of it. Uh, if you're watching online as well, you can just pop on the website as well, and there are the details. Uh, this is our preferred teaching on financial matters. So if you haven't done it, do it. We're also going to touch on some of this later in September as well. There is something coming up which I'm pretty uh, uh, excited about. Um, there is a group called Kin Culture that works from Paul and uh, does excellent foster work with social workers in this area and what have you. And I've had recent contact with them. I'm very uh, impressed by their heart and the work that they're doing and the encouragement to build fostering. And they're running a conference now. I'm hoping that I can introduce you to some of this later on this year. Uh, but they are running a conference here so, uh, uh, re uh, shortly. So I do want to just alert you to that in case you are interested in fostering or you know somebody who is interested in fostering a child. Uh, this is an organization which I feel very um, uh, strong to just say to you that this, this will be worth exploring uh, and engaging with. So if you do know somebody, please pass this information on. Um, there is more information uh, available, and um, we can pass that on to you as well. I uh, also just want to alert you to MESS, Mold, Empower, and Serve. They put out an urgent call this morning for anybody with men's clothing or old tackies, okay? If you have that and you would like to share it with some of the homeless people in this wet, cold weather, you can bring it to El Shaddai or you can take it personally to Enrique's house. Uh, he'd love to welcome you there. And um, if you, the, the, the center of hope is in Queen Street. That's just opposite that bottom car park, that bottom center car park. So if you go towards the bottom center to the car park at the back, opposite that you will see the center of hope. It's clearly, it's clearly marked. So uh, if you do want to help out, uh, you can meet Frenita there. And then two things coming up in the weeks ahead. Next week, uh, we're very pleased that Basil, Basil Sparks, from the Durbanville Baptist Church will be preaching here. And I'm very pleased uh, that you, ha you have heard him before some years back. Uh, but he's written a book called Unshackled. And we always talk about all the books that come from America and England. 
we have an author in our community down the road. And I asked him to come and to preach here, but also to bring a stock of his books called Unshackled. And for 20 rand extra, he'll even sign it, I think. Uh, there. But um, I, I've read, the, I've re I'm about halfway through, to be really honest, and it's full of just real life stories and examples and, and uh, practical inputs to live a life that we're destined to live. And he'll tell the story of how that came about. Uh, I'm sure about that. It's 200 Rand if you buy it on the day. And uh, it'll be available in our foyer. You can use cash, you can use SnapScan, or you can use a Capitec app. Those will be the three ways that you, you can do that. So hopefully you'll come, you'll, in, you'll enjoy meeting up with Basil again and uh, just hearing that story as well. And then something else I want to give you full knowledge of, we will, we will give you a lot more details from next week, but just to start putting it in, on the 4th of September, you know, it's been a very long time since we had some community, the big unity, and we want to do something really special that day. Uh, on the 4th of September, we're going to gather our children, we're going to gather our uh, Friday night youth we're going to gather our young adults. We're going to gather everybody here, everybody watching online. It's not going to be streamed that day. And we're going to bring everybody together just to celebrate unity again. That's been a while since 2019 when we've had that opportunity. We want to celebrate all these different gatherings that sometimes churches end up with silos working. And we want to celebrate that all together here. And afterwards, we want to have a braai as well. We'll give you all the details. Uh, even if it's raining like this, then we will just shift it. But you'll hear all about it. It's going to happen, whatever. Uh, we've got plans here. And we don't want you to rush off. We want you to become an extrovert that day. We're going to pray for the gift of extroversion, you see. And to enjoy a unity of a whole family, the onlines, the inlines, the outline, the whole lot, yeah. We also have invited uh, Mess to come and share that day as well, because community is not just about us, it's also about the community. And in fact, just spotted that, it lines up with the prophetic words in the worship today. So we want to celebrate the anointing of God here, but we've invited Mess to come in to remind us of what community looks like out there as well. And we bring the two together, and we celebrate this, 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 this time. So I want you to put that in your phone now, okay? 4th of September, God will not be, ha no, let's not go there. 4th of September, we're celebrating community. We're celebrating, we're gathering all the different strands here, yeah, putting us all into this space, and then we eat together and share together afterwards. Uh, there'll be stuff for the kids. Um, oh, we'll tell you more about that next week. Sound good? Okay, stick it in your diary then, please. Okay, let me just put, get rid of this. All right, I want to finish off this series on filling your tank before Basil comes next week and tells us how to be unshackled. Yo, this is all, yeah. What I want to talk about today is the discouragement factor, okay? And I'm going to tell you why. You know, um... Perhaps, or let me ask you this question. Do you know what the world's deadliest disease is? It's not COVID, okay? Because you're sitting here. It's not monkeypox. It's not cancer. The world's deadliest disease is discouragement. The world's deadliest disease is discouragement. Nothing will drain your tank quicker than an atmosphere of discouragement. Nothing will rob you of life than when you get into a space of hopelessness and discouragement. It'll just drain the fuel right out of you. Now, discouragement comes in three common ways. If you've waited a long time for something and it hasn't happened... If you have worked hard and you've seen little rewards, or if you try and try and get very little response. 
When those three toxic things come together, this discouragement comes over you and it drains your tank. Now, this series has been called Filling Your Tank, and it was based off the hike, the significant increase in the petrol price. And all of a sudden, it became really expensive to fill your tank. You just see those digits rolling like that and the needle not even moving. Yeah. And so we got into the space where it's expensive to fill your tank. And so many of us were now driving closer and closer to the empty sign and only filling up a little way. And then it will go down quicker than we thought. Now that parallels exactly to what many people have said and experienced wider than this church in all the different social circles that life after COVID feels like, where's the capacity gone? Where's the capacity gone? I had that much capacity, now I've only got this much capacity. It's expensive to fill your tank. It requires something to fill your tank. And many of us are not just filling up a little bit, and we're running closer and closer to the empty. And so we took a few weeks just to, we've taken this as the fourth week, just to talk about this reality and to talk about it from the Bible's perspective because we pick up in our culture around us, everybody's speaking stuff and all these words and these words discourage and add to this thing and they add another layer on it and they, in spite of the fact that our tanks are emptying, everybody else is sucking the petrol out as well. And so there's a challenge here, a challenge here to fill our tanks, to fill our tanks. That's what we've been speaking about in the last four weeks. And I want to finish that off today by looking at this, this thing of discouragement. That's like a plug just pulled out there by those four reasons. Just as a matter of integrity, just acknowledge uh, Michael Green, Charles Gordon, and Rick Warren for just some of this material that I want to share with you today. Uh, as I just encourage you, from the Word of God here this morning. Now let's go back to this thing, folks. Discouragement. The most deadly disease in the world. The most deadly drain on the human soul. The soul is made up of your mind, your will, and your emotions. And the discouragement just sucks it out of those three areas. Now I've shared this story with you before, but I can't think of a better one. It's a story of Satan having a garage sale. You know what a garage sale is, or a car boot sale, or whatever, whatever it is. And he's having a garage sale, and he's got all his implements out, and they're hanging on the wall, and they're all carefully priced there. They're there, they're all on the floor, hate, anger, lying, all these terrible, terrible things that, that uh, the enemy does to our souls. And they're all priced, and they're all priced. And somebody comes into this place... And to, to this, this, this garage sale, and he's looking at all these implements here. And he sees one at the, on the wall, which is an old, worn spade. But it's priced the most out of everything. And he says, why is that one so expensive and it's so old? And he said, because that's discouragement. It's the most effective tool of all. If I can't get into a human soul through anger, through lies and all the rest of it, then I use discouragement to prize open his soul and open the door to everything else. That's what you're dealing with. That's what you're dealing with. If you are strong here, you're not into anger and all these other things and what have you, there's still this other one that comes off the wall highly priced, that can prize us open and drain our tanks. We have to speak about that. We have to speak about that this morning. And the example in the Bible that we can turn to, because the Bible's got everything here, the example in the Bible is Nehemiah. Let's have a look at Nehemiah. Let's see what happened with him. A man who suffered <laughs> deeply from the drained tank of discouragement. It's not hard to see why. He was the guy that was the big shot next to the king. He would 
taste everything and he was the right hand to the king. He felt a call of God to go back to Jerusalem, which had been devastated by the Babylonians, raised to the ground, burnt there. And he felt the call of God to go and rebuild the wall around Jerusalem, the security around Jerusalem. So he takes a bunch of people with him, enthusiastic people in Babylon who said, yes, we hear that call. We're with you. We've got zeal. We've got passion. We've got strength. We're coming with you to fulfill this calling. We're going to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. And that's what we see here. We hear that in Nehemiah 4. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it had reached half its height. Look at this part. For the people worked with all their hearts. These are zealous people here. These are called people. These are passionate people. They love God. They love this call. Have a look a few verses later now. Verse 10. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, The strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot build the wall. Also, our enemies said, Before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them, and we will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. I'm just going to co- focus on those three verses, 10, 11, and 12, because those three verses tell us why we get discouraged. It's in those three verses. And there are four reasons why we struggle with discouragement. Number one, because of tiredness. Have a look at the verse. The strength of the laborers is giving out. One of the reasons why we get discouraged is because we just get tired. We just get tired. Our strength is running out. And we live in a world that is just pressing the whole time. And eventually we just tire out. And when we get into that space of tiring out, we open the door to discouragement. That's what the Scripture is teaching us. It's showing us that right there. Now, one of the reasons why you get tired is because our society no longer encourages us to have a Sabbath day's rest. And God said, on the seventh day, you will stop working. Now, that doesn't mean sitting around or doing nothing. It just means you don't work that day. You refill. And we tire because even if our bodies aren't working, our minds are still working. We're sitting on our phones, we're checking, we're doing this, we're doing that. You cannot disobey God's principles and not get taken out. And we, we play with fire. When he says, for one day a week you will rest, you won't work, you won't study, you won't check emails, you won't sit and scroll endlessly through nonsense here. Yeah. That's what's there to refill you. You cannot play with that. And that's one of the reasons why we struggle with discouragement at that point. The Bible even tells us exactly when the discouragement will hit you. It tells you exactly. Have a look at verse 6. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. Halfway through any project, you'll start getting tired and discouraged. And most of us give up when we're halfway through. We're zealous. We're in. We're running cell group, we're running business, we're taking initiatives. Halfway through, discouragement hits. I bet you it's halfway through. Do you know why I bet you? Because we have a compost heap. And all the grass cuttings go on the compost heap. See, and this compost heap gets pretty high now because we don't do anything about it. Yeah. And for some reason, guided by a member of the congregation sitting here this morning, who I won't identify, but she suggested it's the best time of the year to get our beds ready for spring. And Judy thought that was a wonderful idea, you see? And she came up with this suggestion. She said, we should move some of the compost from there to there. Have you ever worked out what we means? It's exactly like that. So I got a wheelbarrow, and I started shoveling. I'm zealous. This is exercise. (laughs) This is cool. This is good for me. Yeah. Halfway through, I'm sitting and saying, I'm sure God didn't intend this. 
I'm tired of this. I'm over this. And that discouragement comes in. Anyway, the whip worked and I did finish the, the task. But what I want to say to you guys, yeah, discouragement will hit any one of us halfway through the task. And it's not. It's not that way it's meant to be. But it's one of the ways that it comes in through tiredness. He has the second one that Scripture says so clearly. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the halfway through thing. If you've run a marathon, you'll know by the time you get to halfway, you're over it. If you've tried to get your kid to clean up their bedroom, halfway through? Okay, let's not go there. If you've tried to clean up your desk, do you make my point? Second point, why we get discouraged. Because we get overwhelmed. And the scripture says this. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. They got overwhelmed. Again, I saw this in real life just recently. We've been building this fence around this property here. Every single one of those pillars has quite a deep hole beneath it. And I watched them digging these holes. And they bring in jackhammers. They bring in pretty serious power stuff to get through the rock and to get through the hard soil. And at the end of all these pillars, there was this huge pile for this deepish hole, but this massive pile of just rubble and rocks and useless stuff here. That's exactly the same image as what was happening here. Let me paint the picture for you, and you can see why they were overwhelmed. They get to this place here, to Jerusalem, which had been razed to the ground. The temple had been completely devastated by the Babylonians, literally to the ground. And the wall around it had been smashed. All that was around the whole of Jerusalem was piles of burnt bricks, because they'd used fire, and rubble and rubble, and they came to rebuild the temple. Now, the wall around the temple. Now, the way they were going to do that, they were digging through the rubble, looking for the bricks that were still okay, and the rocks that were still okay, and putting them in place, and putting them in place. Now you start to understand why they were overwhelmed. Because for the first time, the thing, they're zealous. There's lots of rocks here. They're easy to get to. They can put them, they can put them in place and what have you. Halfway through, they just look around them, and they just see all this rubble now. And now they've got to dig. And now they've got to try and find those things. And they are overwhelmed. Now, folks, that's another reason why we get discouraged. When we get overwhelmed by all the rubble, we find it just completely overwhelming. Here's the truth. Some of us have got so much junk in our minds that it's like overwhelming for us to even take the smallest initiative. There's so much stuff going around in our minds, fears and and paranoia and, and stuff going on that when somebody says, can you possibly help me reach out to this situation or be part of this? We just say, I can't do it anymore. I can't do it. I'm overwhelmed. How many people have you heard just say, I'm overwhelmed by the current situations? It's because there's too much rubble, too much junk, and that stuff needs to be cleared out. Let's move on a little more quickly here. He has the third reason Nehemiah says that we get discouraged. I can't do this. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said the strength of the laborers is giving out. There is so much rubble. Look at those words. We cannot rebuild this wall. I can't do it anymore. Have you heard people say that? I'm just overwhelmed. I can't do it. I quit. I give up. I withdraw. I'm not going to do anything anymore. I'm, I'm done. I'm putting a boundary in. Meanwhile, there's just discouragement there. They're walking away from the calling of God on their life because they've given in to discouragement. People respond to discouragement in two ways. The one, the, the one way you all know, they just become self-piteous. Poor me. I'm overwhelmed. I can't do this anymore. My life's too complex. No, your life's got too much junk in it. It needs to simplify so people respond with self-pity. Here's the other way people respond when they're discouraged. The blame game. It's because of that situation. It's because of so-and-so. It's because of my pre-primary school teacher and the poor potty training I had and all the rest of it. I can't do it anymore. 
And we're hearing so many people when they, when, and it's just saying, I can't do it anymore. I'm putting a line. I'm putting a boundary and all this kind of stuff and whatever. I'm not saying that's unhealthy, but some of it is actually the result of discouragement. Some of it is actually just needing to clear some junk out of your life so that you can do what God has called. And here's the fourth reason why we get discouraged is fear. Have a look at this verse 11 here. Before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came to us and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. You see, the, <coughs> the wall represents security. The people, the enemies, the Babylonians and the, and the, and the, and the, the grouping of people there, they didn't want the security to go up. They wanted it to be taken out. So when they see the wall going up around the, around, around the temple where the temple is going to be rebuilt, they immediately hit hard on that. And what do they use? They use words. We're going to kill you. We're going to take you out. We're going to scare you here. Now watch something else which is really, really key in this verse. There's a very, very powerful uh, word in this verse here. I don't know if you can put it up again I'm, uh, there. Look at verse 12. Then the Jews who lived near them and told us ten times over. Who are the most dangerous people? The people who are near the negative people. The negative people, they're done. Okay. You know who the dangerous ones are? The ones that live near them. Because they've heard ten times over, we're going to kill you, we're going to kill you, we're going to kill you. And they spread that poison of discouragement amongst everybody else. Who's speaking into your ears? What words are you listening to? Because those people may be the very ones that are discouraging you from the call of God on your life. The people near you. And you visit them ten times, and ten times they spew the same negativity out. We're going to kill you. We're going to kill you. Fear, 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 fear. Until you're taken out by discouragement. And so we have Nehemiah picking up the four reasons for discouragement. But good old Nehemiah, he also tells us how to deal with it. Yeah. How to break the dis. Stop dissing yourselves. Get rid of the dis and live by the courage, is what Nehemiah says. So we've done up to 10, 11, and 12. Have a look at verse 13 and 14. And therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points on the wall, at the exposed place that I posted them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. And after I looked things over, I stood up and I said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, and your daughters, and your wives, and your homes. Nehemiah says you've got to break the dis. Discouragement. Break the dis and come back to the courage. And he gives us three ways in which he does that. Number one, he organizes because discouragement scatters us. Do you know what discouragement does? Is it causes you to withdraw into your home, into your world, into your safe place. Where only you can encourage yourself. He doesn't do that. He organizes people. He puts them back in place. He gets things focused again. And that's what the first thing that you've got to do. Come back to your focus. Come back to what God has called you to do. Come back there. Get organized there. Put in the right habits to live by your focus of what God has called you to do. Now, there's a very good book that um, we actually read it on the school board uh, here called Atomic Habits. It's not a Christian book, but it could jolly well be one. Yeah. If you need to organize your life, I suggest you go and buy that book, Atomic Habits. And I didn't check with you, Maketi, but... He's the genius of Atomic Habits. He's got two copies. Yeah. And you'll understand exactly what I'm going to say uh, in, if you read the book. But part of his habits, it's a 1% improvement each day, putting in the routines to organize your life. So he gets out of his car, and right next to his car is his gym mat for his exercise routine. Before he even goes into the house, if you read the book, you'll understand exactly what this is about. 
It's a man building, organizing, putting the habits in place, atomic habits to make you explode again. Yeah. Now, if you sit here this morning and you say, yo, I'm so disorganized, it's just all. Do you know what happens when you're disorganized? It gets overwhelming. And you just go, I can't do more. Yeah. Yes, you can. Nehemiah says reorganize. But there's another very deep insight in that verse there. Notice how, notice how he says to them to reorganize. Remember the Lord is great. Fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. What does he mean? You don't fight alone. You fight as a family. You fight discouragement as a whole family, as a cell group family, as a church family, as a biological family, as a friendship family. What's it saying? Discouragement takes you out. It picks you out as an individual. It says, come, you. I withdraw you from your family support thing, and you're dead. How do you know this? Have you got a fireplace? Take a burning coal out of the fire and see what happens to it. Speak discouragement over that coal. Take the coal out of the fire and say, you're dead, mate. Yeah. Withdraw it from the heat, from the others. What will happen to that coal? It dies. So will you. So will you. Because you can't break discouragement alone. You lock arms with family, with friends, with your cell group. With your community, you lock arms together and you let the heat of the Spirit come from one to the other because life's real. There is discouragement, but you need the encouragement of somebody else. The Bible says that. Encourage one another. Why? Because we get discouraged. How do you encourage yourself? I look in the mirror, be of good courage, be of good courage. Be... No. Link with family, link with friends, link with your cell group, and speak encouragement. No cell group should be an atmosphere where, where everybody should leave a cell group, where everybody feels super encouraged, because there's just such an atmosphere of encouragement there. That's how it's meant to be. That's what the scripture says, encourage one another. So that's the first way Nehemiah says you deal with it. Do you want the second way? It's intimacy with God. Have a look at that verse again. Therefore... Uh, sorry, verse 14. After I looked things over, I stood up and I said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the, the people, don't be afraid of them. Look what he says. Remember the Lord. <laughs> so the first way is to organize. The second way is to remember the Lord. Have a look at what the Message Bible says of that verse. Of looking things over, I stood up and I spoke to the nobles, the officials, and everybody else. Don't be afraid of them. Look at this part. Put your minds on the master, great and awesome. Hey, you can't break discouragement without God. Because sometimes the circumstances around you are so bleak and so worthy of discouragement that you have to see God in it. That you have to have your eyes above the situation. You can organize all you like. Yeah. Yeah. But sometimes you just have to see God and have a look at what it says and say, God, this is terrible, but you are great and awesome. Now, is there a biblical precedent for this? How would you like to be Job? Hmm? What did Job do? God, I've just got monkey pox everywhere. Yeah. But you are great and awesome. And all the friends, what were they doing near him? Man, you're going to die, you're going to die, 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 die. Job says, cheers. Is Job enough for you? What about Paul in prison? There. What did he do? He rejoiced. Read Philippians. He rejoiced in prison. God, you are great and awesome. I'm in prison. I'm shackled. I can't move. I've been beaten. I've been pulped. Everything. And what about Jesus on the cross? Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. When are we going to learn to remember God and be encouraged by our God? When? Look at the scriptures. We're not alone in the discouragement factors. The scriptures are full of God speaking this stuff here. Joshua 1.9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be dis 
terrified. And what's that word next? Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. I, I, I don't know whether you should do this in your Bible, but I suggest you circle it as a command, not a suggestion, but a command from God. Are you going to disobey that one? Look at 1 Chronicles. So it wasn't just Joshua. It was also David said to Solomon, his son. Some of us need to say this to our sons and our daughters. Be strong, son. Be strong, daughter. And courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid. What? Or discouraged. For the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail nor forsake you until all the work for the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. Do we believe the word? Look at Corinthians. And therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And just another one from Deuteronomy picking up the same theme. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid and terrified because of them. Because of them. Who's the them in your life? Who's the them? Because then this word is for you. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the presence of all Israel, Be strong and courageous for you must go with the people into the land that the Lord swore to the forefathers to give them and you must divide it among them as their inheritance the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you he will never leave you nor forsake you what do not be afraid do not be discouraged remember God and here's the last point for today you've got to fight you can organize you can remember God, but you've also got to fight. Have a look at verse 14. After I looked things over, I stood up and I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, your, your, the Lord who is great and awesome. And what comes next? And fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Fight. Fight in your soul groups. Don't put up with this, this discouragement week in and week out. Fight with your brothers and your sisters and your mothers and your fathers and your children. We don't do discouragement. We fight it. We speak to it. Because the scripture says encourage one another. And it's time to rise up. It's time to rise up and fight this stuff. And deal with it. Really think. The Bible says this. It says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The devil's not going to flee from you because you're sweet. No. Uh -uh, it doesn't work like that. You've got to resist him. When he brings out that discouragement thing, you have to fight him. You've got to resist him. It's a spiritual battle to get into your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions. He wants to get in there. Because once he's in there, he can form a stronghold. Do you know what a stronghold is? It's a mindset impregnated with hopelessness. If you hear somebody speaking hopelessly, you can look them in the eye and say, you've got a stronghold. And the only way a stronghold goes is by deliverance. You have to resist the devil. What is this saying? It's saying to you and I that discouragement is a spiritual power. It's a spiritual power, and it will only be dealt with spiritually. You have to resist. You have to fight. Even in your own homes, you may have to fight for this. Some of you have got parents. You've got grandparents. You've got children that just breathe the stuff into the home. The atmosphere of the home. Are we all there, man? You know, It's not the person next to you. It's you. We're all there. We all have to rise up. But you cannot do it alone. Fight with your family. Fight with your cell group. Fight, not fight with your cell group, but fight with your cell group. Man. Folks, the scripture's clear. Encourage, encourage, encourage. How do you fight if you discourage? Number one, you submit to God. You get on your knees, you repent, you surrender. God, we don't do that nearly enough. Just get him on our knees next to our bed and say, I surrender, God. This is so difficult. This is so confusing. This is so discouraging. But you are God and I'm not. And I surrender to you. That's what it means, submit to God. Resist Him. 
sometimes, do you know what? Do you know what resistance looks like? Just changing your thought pattern. Whatever is pure, whatever is holy, whatever is good, think on these things. Just change your thought pattern. Think about something else. Just say, ha! <laughs> you know? What, I think it was Smith Wigglesworth. Oh, it's only you, Satan, turned over and went to sleep. When are we going to get this confidence in God and say, I know where that thought's come from, but I've got a better thought to think about. That's what it means. That's what it means to resist. Here's what it means to stand. Do you know what it means to stand? Why don't you stand up? You just did it. <laughs> Give yourself a real good... Yeah. And so, Lord Jesus, just as we come into this place now, I ask for your Holy Spirit to change lives. And just as you stay in this presence now, the last four weeks we've been speaking about dealing with the drain on your tank. It's been a ham sandwich. The first week we spoke about fear. Fear is the base of everything. The first human negative emotion was fear in the Garden of Eden. Then we spoke about one of the ways of dealing with the drain on your tank is to reach out to somebody else, to give yourself away. Last week, Enrique shared with you just the importance of learning to be at peace even in a storm. And today we speak about discouragement. We're really trusting for something right now from the Holy Spirit that you will not be a drained fillet petunia but you will be strong and encouraged that you would have capacity that you'd be full of the Holy Spirit and that you would be there for the homeless and for the famous you can't do it in your own strength. Believe me, you can't. But if Nehemiah is true for you, you can do it. You organize. You develop intimacy with God. And you fight. There's nothing more I can say to you. The word of God stands on its own. And so in this moment of just brief silence, send your own prayer of surrender up. Make your own decision to Break the dis and to be a man or a woman of courage. Make the decision before God. It's not going to be perfect, but he's given you the wherewithal to live this message out. So make your prayer to God this morning. Do not be afraid. I have commanded you. Do not be afraid. Be courageous. I command you. Break the dis. For I will be with you and never forsake you. He's a God worthy of worship this morning. Worthy of worship. Worthy of worship. Because he's pouring courage into you today.
Jesus for filling us this morning. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being here this morning. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for encouraging us this morning that we can do all things through the Father who loves us with compassion and kindness. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. If anyone needs some prayer or ministry, please step forward. There will be people here in front who would love to pray for you. Thank you for joining us online. and Have a blessed week. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are.